Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of the New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with Albuquerque's first poet laureate, Hakeem Bellamy, a dear friend and a wonderful writer. Hakeem is a two-time national slam champion. That's an amazing accomplishment in its own right. A journalist, a media literacy teacher, playwright, and actor. And he's the current host of Canemese Polaris. This is the second in a series of interviews with writers and editors exploring the state of poetry in the contemporary world and its impact on politics and on humanitarian action. The first was with Don McIver, who's the Mercury's poetry curator. Poetry, its audiences, its distribution systems have changed drastically in the last 10 to 15 years. It's become a public art form again, hearkening back to its beginnings, uh, thanks to slam, to hip hop, uh, to the evolution of new writers, to greater diversity, uh, to new openness, to a wide ranging uh, subject matter, and many new voices. So it's wonderful to be able to talk with you about these matters, and uh, it's just great to have you with us here today, Hucky. Thank you, Phoebe. It's so it's such an honor to be here. Uh, especially with you, you know, and all of the, the road paving you've done for writers of my ilk as a poet and as a journalist. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you so much. So I have sort of three questions in one. Uh, one, what's it like being the poet laureate in Albuquerque? And what's been your vision uh, for that role? And what do you think should come next after your tenure is up? What's it like being a poet laureate? Uh, man, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's a little different for me than for past laureates <laughs> of any kind, of any municipality, of any state, of any, of any country. Um, for me, it's been a particularly, I don't know, it's, it's, it's been a particularly rich experience because I, I feel like, and uh, I don't know the numbers or the actual research on this, but I feel like most, if not, if not all, but I know it's not all. But most, if not all, poet laureates um, tend to be to get this kind of recognition later in their career. They tend to get it uh, as a kind of crown jewel, as a kind of career or lifetime achievement award towards the end of their career. While uh, I was, I had the great fortune to to really get this on the uptake and the upswing of my career. And I think it's a testament not necessarily just to the work that I do as a writer, but the work I do in the community. And I think that's what's unique about the position in Albuquerque that it, it places a heavy premium, a heavy emphasis on a poet's ability to work within, between, and across communities. Yes. Um, their resume in doing that, which is, which is as important as their literary and publishing resume component of the application process, but really um, somebody who can really bring poetry, at least in my understanding, someone who really is going to try to bring poetry to the communities it doesn't already matter to. And that's kind of what I would say. That was kind of my shtick when I first got this this position was that my job is not to go to the coffee shops necessarily because there's plenty of poets. There's a number of poets in Albuquerque, many very well quali qualified for this position. And I hope you apply because <laughs> the application window is coming open yeah. soon. Um, in April, right? And yeah, it's got actually, we, we, we do the ceremony in April, but the application window will be open this fall. This fall. And it'll end December ish, January. Wow. And then there'll be an announcement in April. Good. But, uh, sure. but really this idea that, uh, that I could go to the slams, but I know the slams. Um, I can go to the coffee house readings or the academic readings, and I've been embraced there as a performance poet, which is awesome. And that's that's something that's also kind of unique to Albuquerque. But everybody there already likes poetry. Everybody there already loves poetry, sees it as something valuable in their life, sees it as more than just a, a product for consumption, but actually something that enriches their life, helps them live longer, help them form, form more meaningful relationships, and so on and so on. So my job is to go to the other communities yes. where, um, you know, poetry is seen as something that's a bore. And a lot of classrooms I go into, that's a ha that happens. Or it's, it seems as it's something that you should do if you have a, little, a couple extra dollars on the weekend. Maybe you'll go see some poetry as opposed to making it part of our lifestyle and, and our culture, which is really indigenous and germane to all of us. Uh, culturally, that that time that existed, you know, between like dinosaurs and television, people used to do poetry, right? <laughs> <So> <laughs> they used to do poetry, you know, and it's it's uh, That's wonderful. So it's fun. I feel like for me, it's been cool to kind of carry that flag and really be a advocate for the arts and for poetry specifically, but also um, picking up the challenge to to really 
push myself as an artist and a performer to make poetry meaningful and make it matter in these communities that haven't seen it seen it matter yet in Albuquerque. So that's that's why I think my my job is and and that's my vision for the role to continue to be that. You know, uh, I have some ideas of who I'd like to see in the laureate ship next. I, I'd be I'd be lying and disingenuous if I didn't say uh, I had some ideas. And I hope that those people apply. But most importantly, I hope that it's someone that's willing to say you know to put the service aspect before their career aspect. I think that that's, that's what's important. Like if you want to win the national book award, there's plenty of great writing programs you can go to and that you can have that on your resume. You can go after that, but you don't necessarily need this title to do that. Um, what this title needs is somebody who's going to say, I'll do whatever it takes to make Albuquerque poetry meaningful to a kindergartner and someone, uh, in hospice, like the whole, the whole gamut. So, I know you're teaching uh, summer classes uh, uh, for 17 students uh, at the, the Voces program, which started a number of years back and has had some wonderful anthologies and great young writers. Does this, um, does uh, the Voces reflect uh, the kinds of communities that you want to bridge and bring new work to and to, and to make poetry come alive to again? It certainly does. Uh, it's, you know, this year is the, uh, my, my role this year has expanded as in, as opposed to past years. And, and before we even talk about this, I want to make sure that people know that yeah. you've been connected to that program for a long time. And we appreciate that in helping uh, us publish the first anthology of poems there. Uh, Michaela Renz uh, Whitmore, a dear friend of mine, was one of the major impetus in, in making sure this program existed so many years and did a lot of the editing which falls into my lap now and she was a much better editor <laughs> than, than, I, editor. than I am <laughs> right so uh so uh you know it's 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 been rich but uh in, but in last year i guess about around last year um it, you know uh, people were transitioning and people move on and, and things were happening and uh and funding issues were happening as well and uh, that's how urban verbs came to be involved and urban verbs is my hip-hop Theater collaborative, um, uh, started by thanks. Started by uh, myself, uh, Dials, Colin Dials, Hazel Baker, who's more of our sound audio engineer, film work, media guy, who also was a fine writer and musical performer himself, and then Carlos Contreras, who is actually a product of the Voces program. So he's oh, come through the program, um, and was and was kind of the right hand man to Michaela for a number of years there. And so we we it kind of uh, it really he is the one that kind of positioned us to be able to be part of the program in a much more increased role this year. And so uh, we have some amazing young brains, like short story writers, musicians, poets, the requisite poets that are, have to be there. Um, we have a couple of visual artists in the group. And so that in that way, I feel like we're certainly kind of, I don't know, how do I say it? We're certainly an example of poetry's expanded role in uh, emerging generation because it's so interdisciplinary it's so uh, multi-genre you know that that's that's how poetry has been able to survive you know just like poetry uh, daily is on any one of my students or any one of your students facebook pages they'll put a couple lines of poetry on their facebook wall they'll tweet a line of poetry or a haiku and so in that way you know even though if monetarily if you're talking about just our book sales of poetry still expanding no they're shrinking they're on a decline but the amount of poetry that people share has expanded greatly if we yeah. if we if we acknowledge it um, in a new vehicle in a new medium in a new form so i think my students are a great example of that I, we're, we're fortunate to be able to have the program and offer it free of charge to 17 students. Oh, we could we could take up to 20 and we had more and then, you know, uh, but the, that's a testament to these students' work ethic and, you know, they could have jobs right now. They could be making money. They choose to come write intensively and intensely oh, <laughs> for a month. Yeah. And, uh, and we ask them to do lots of things that are out of their comfort zone. You know, we're doing some work with the Manoa Project. Uh, who's Trick Lock Theater Company's summer oh, program. They're, they're on the same campus with, uh, at the National Hispanic Cultural Center with us, uh, Circo Latino, which is the circus camp. And so our students are interacting with these other students and they're being forced to improv and they're being forced to learn other tricks, but all of that informs their writing and it, and it makes their writing more rich. It makes their team building aspect of what they're doing because they've been hanging out as a, as a team of writers now for two weeks already. And so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's really it's really fascinating thing to watch and be part of and kind of help direct traffic and tour guide. 
You know, that sounds so wonderful. I wonder what would have happened to me, and I expect you too, if we had that as, Absolutely. A, as young people. I mean, I think I, it would have probably changed my life. I know you're going to uh, give us a reading of the work of one of your students, but why, yes. don't, we, why don't we save that for the, the kind of the, the, uh, the creme de la creme at the okay. end of the... Make them wait. Make them wait. <laughs> make, make them wait a little while. Make them wait. Make them wait a little while. I wanted to sort of, sort of um, uh, touch a little bit on the relationship between media literacy, mm -hmm. which I know is a is an expertise of yours, and uh, you've done a lot of research into it, and and its uh, connection to this expanded role of poetry. Um, students are suddenly uh, have a very critical view of, of what they're reading and what they're being told. And, of course, uh, the world of, of our art form, poetry, is uh, to be critical, to be, to be open, to be free, to be absolutely dead honest all the way down the line. So there must be some powerful relationship between those two disciplines. I, I, think, I think you, to, to break out a cliche, you've hit the nail squarely on the head. Uh, it, it it seems it seems that it's true that absolute honesty is 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 kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from advertising <laughs> and rhetoric and persuasion and things of that nature. So you're right, we have a kind of inherent um, conflict of interests as poets with uh, with propaganda, yes. with with media and communication for the sake of selling someone something, whether they're selling them something monetarily or whether they're selling them an idea um, or whether they're, you know, selling, I don't know, less freedom, more control, things of that nature, yes, right? Things, you of know, that nature, yeah. things of that nature. And so uh, I totally agree with the idea that in its roots, in its very nature, poetry is is a form of media literacy. And especially as performance poets, we, we work with young people who have, you know, something to get off their chest. And usually it's a different analysis than we have or our parents had. Oh, yes. And, you know, and that speaking truth to power, um, whether it's financial power or governmental power or authority in general, uh, that, that itself is, is a process of deconstruction. And so we talk about that in media literacy, like, OK, well, not just what message is being directed at us but who's directing it why are they directing it what's their end goal what are they trying to get from us um it's not it's not just this benign sharing of data and information right okay. and so uh and that's what they come like you know students that that, that we get to work with all already, already come with a hunger for that questioning oh. right they're already there with that and then what we kind of give them the opportunity to do uh, specifically in urban verbs but i think in general as as poetry educators as arts educators is um you know Enrich that voice, make that voice a little bit louder, refine that voice, turn it into a real tool that they can use, right, to get whatever they need to get out of life, whether it's something emotional, whether it's something financial, whatever. But at, but at the end of the day, you know, we're asking them to create enough noise to counter to counterbalance the other noise, right? And so if you're only hearing one message and that message doesn't look like you, doesn't sound like you, doesn't represent your culture, well, we could complain about it. And we could go through the regular channels and talk to our politicians and maybe wait for change sometime down the line. Or we can create. And I always say that that's a better, like you're not gonna get them to necessarily change what's on network television. Yeah. But now you could create your own media and get people to watch yes. it. So you don't have to support that paradigm or that dominant frame anymore. We can actually counter through media creation. And that's a huge part of media literacy. Um, when I used to work at Media Literacy Project, I, I really liked that about their framework because it wasn't just, we're gonna break this down, we're gonna understand it, and we're gonna get angry. It was, no, we're gonna break this down, we're gonna understand it, and then we're gonna create options God, for ourselves and for other people. And, and at the very root of all of that, whether it's film, whether it's visual art, whether it's music, whether it's poetry, it, it, it's 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 starting off with a person saying hey I got something to say people will listen to this now I just have to figure out how to get it out there and how they're gonna say how they're gonna receive it so uh, during conversations we've had uh, you said I think that a poet is a reporter in a certain sense uh, relaying his ex his or her ex experiences of the world uh, poets who work with younger poets I think you said produce or help to produce mm -hmm. producers um, unlike pop media that merely produces consumers. Yes. Could you talk about that just a little yeah. bit more? Yeah, I, I, 
that 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 little saying, you know, instead of producing uh, consumers, we produce producers, right? Um, really, at the end of the day, that is, uh, you know, the powers that be. I don't I don't really need to kick butt and take names right now, but you know, the powers that be that are giving us what they think that we want as far as television, as far as radio, as far as print, as far as poetry, yeah. publishers, like people saying that they know what we need and, and crowning themselves the judge and juror of that because we don't know what's best for ourselves, of course. So we need to let someone tell us what we need to buy or what we need to read or what we need to listen to or what we need to watch. Um, we, we flip that on its frame and we say, you know, you are your own, you're the best expert on yourself and you're the best expert on your community. So when stories need to be told uh, about whatever community you're identifying with or, or attempting to represent, whatever part of you you're identifying with and trying to represent at a particular amount of particular point in time, then you're the best agent to tell that story. You're the best change agent to make things different in your community. And uh, and that what we do matters. It matters in that sense. And that's why we can be producers. Producers aren't just people who have millions of dollars and, and sign off on films. Producers are, if you write a poem that a thousand people can see at your school assembly and 10,000 people can later see on YouTube, you've just produced yourself, right? God. You know, and you've and you've really kind of made it created your own kind of echo chamber for your voice. That's that's independent of a corporate construct. And if no one else can profit off of you, then it's really a free exchange of ideas. It's it's really you, and that's when you're dangerous. <laughs> that's when you're dangerous. So. so before we get to the poem, which I'm eager to hear, yeah, uh, she had a good poem. I know you're eager to read. Mm -hmm. um, you've also said that poetry puts real people and marginal displaced voices back into the center of the story, which I thought was a wonderful way of saying it. And I got to wondering, um, when it comes to your own poetry, who are you writing for? And um, who's, in your, who's in your mind's eye? So, uh, yeah, when I first, it's changed. It's changed, uh, VB. You know, when I first started calling myself a poet, when I first started identifying as a poet, you know, that was after I moved here. And, you know, we had success with the College Poetry Slam team. And unbeknownst to me, we were getting ready to win the National Poetry Slam. <laughs> yeah, right. But, you know, that summer, you know, uh, I was on the team. And as part of the work that we do on the team is we go into schools and, and it's like kind of the first time people start asking you questions and you feel like a little celebrity. You're like, people want to know my philosophy of writing. Wow, I never never really thought about it before, you know? <laughs> like, you know, um, uh, now I get to keep refining my answer to that question. But when people ask me then, you know, I'd say, because uh, I was really, you know, I came into this kind of poetry performance world really bursting at the seams with exactly what you talked about. Like this idea that nobody ever really cared or cared to ask a uh, 20, you know, gosh, 26, 27 year old kid, black kid from South Jersey, Philadelphia, what his view of the world is. Yeah. Like nobody cared for my story. I was not, I was not the mainstream middle-aged white male. I didn't have a lot of buying power like some of the middle-aged women. And like, and, you know, and I'm just thinking of all the different demographics that were around me growing yeah. up where you, you saw yourself on television, you saw yourself in advertisement, you saw yourself as news broadcasters. Only time I ever saw myself was, you know, front shot, side shot on the news, right? Or on the basketball court or, you know, Tiger came along and sprinkled some pepper on the PGA. Like, you know, but occasionally you'd see these these figures and then, you know, of course it's like, well, why aren't you Oprah or Bill Cosby? You can do better. And so there was like a dearth of voices that were normal, average voices, you know? And so that's what I mean when I say putting us at the center of the conversation. Like we have stories to tell and when something happens, God forbid in Syria, uh, you know, some, then people will listen to what Brad Pitt has to say about it when he's, not to my knowledge, and I love, love Brad Pitt, but not to my knowledge, he's no geography scholar. He's not a, st he's not a student of African, you know, sociology. And so, but, but so why does what he care or what he thinks about a particular situation matter more than mine? Okay. Well, and for that reason, even even the generals and the people that are on the ground who are talking about the military approach and things of that nature, they're not talking about the people, the actual people of Syria. So that's a story that we don't hear and we never hear in the news. And so I, I'm looking at this as a young man. And when I first have the opportunity to have a platform where people will actually listen to me for three minutes, because the average length of a slam poem, 
That's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about the things that they never get to hear my side of the story, right? And I'm gonna get to do that. And uh, so when I was first starting, that was my, that was really my angle. And I always said, you know, to keep it, to keep it real, like we say in hip hop, or to keep it honest. I was always trying to say something profound, but that could be received by a 16 year old black kid in Philadelphia. Like my, my baby brother, Tyler, is 10 years younger than me. And as an older brother, there's nothing cooler than being cool to your younger brother. So I always thought that if I thought of him and his homies who would probably rather not be thinking about foreign policy in North Africa, but if I can package this in a way where they actually would care for a second because I said it cool, then, uh, then I've done everything I need to do as an artist and with yes. my writing and with my poetry. It just so happened that other people liked that too. And it caught on to people besides my target audience. And I was grateful, but I always knew if I can't take these poems back home to that street corner where my homies and my, my youngest brother's homies are hanging out, if they don't care, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, you know? Um, and so I, in the beginning, that was, that was a lot of what I do. do I, I still think that's my focus now, but mind you now, He's not 16 anymore. <laughs> He's 26 now, right? Right, 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 right? You know, so I am writing for a younger audience, but not as young an audience anymore, right? right? right, right. You know, but uh, but still, I think I still, I think I still shoot for that center, and if I keep shooting for that center, I, I hit I hit other targets too, and I feel like that that works. That's what keeps me honest, you know. So here in Albuquerque, we have many, many, many different kinds of communities. Uh, uh, of all kinds, geographic communities, cultural communities, uh, occupational communities. We also have probably thousands of poets, which I find w wonderful to in the extreme, but I don't really understand why we have them all here. I mean, why is all of this talent here? Why are there all these musicians, all these actors, all these novelists and writers, but why are all the poets here too? So this this uh, combination of a multi-community world, this is this is not a town that is a that is homogeneous. Uh, and that's what makes it so marvelous and so magical really. Uh, does the does the diversity in community lead to the diversity of the poetic voice? in New Mexico and in Albuquerque particularly? That is a fabulous uh, question. And it made me think of the chicken and egg scenario. Like, oh. I don't know if it's the diversity of the poetry that brings diverse communities to the poetry events, or if it's the diversity of the people that, you know, I'm pretty sure it's the diversity of the people that creates the diverse poetry. Yeah. But uh, but what comes first, right? Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because I think uh, I've just had the good fortune to talk about this at the National Federation of State Poetry Societies. And uh, Shirley Blackwell, who's the president of the New Mexico State Poetry Society, really, when I had to sit, I made some remarks for the welcome. She wanted me to really make sure I hit that piece. She said, please help these other people who are visiting uh, from other states and state poetry societies understand that in New Mexico, we really have uh, a motley scene in which there's not a lot of separation. Um, well, let's say there's not that historical separation between academic poets and like your more cultural social movement grassroots movement poets and performance and slam poets and you know the 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 kind of poetic side of the hip-hop scene in town like really here we all work together and in concert and uh and how that's a beautiful thing and how that actually helps everybody's craft grow instead of being exclusive instead of going on this scarcity model like the less stuff we like makes us you know more discerning and more critical and and somehow there's value placed on things when they're at a premium uh i feel like we kind of exhibit the opposite and and when in a, in a space where everyone's a poet that means there's more audience for poetry uh yeah. now i can have different arguments and we can have arguments off camera how does that help or hurt the quality yeah. but quality is relative like depends on who you're talking to yeah. like the best poem at a bookshop reading is not necessarily going to be the poem that's going to get the attention of the students in my classroom right. and so how do we how do we celebrate the fact that there's enough for everyone and there's enough to go around and make sure that the right poetry meets the right audiences. And I think that that happens a lot in Albuquerque. I feel like I agree with you, pound for pound, there's cities bigger than us, but per capita, we probably have more poets per square foot <laughs> than, than any other, than any other midsize or large city. And uh, I think it's a testament to what we have here. I think it's a testament to the history of artists coming here 
visual artist and being inspired by the sky and the air and place and culture that has been here long before, you know, New Mexico has turned 100 yeah. in the eyes of the United States. Long before the United States was even a, a blip on the mental radar screen of anyone who lived in North America. There were people here loving culture and sharing stories. And I think that tradition is what really makes it attractive to people from, from anywhere. People, we have all kinds of poets passing through here. We just had a weekend where we had poets from Oklahoma and Texas and New Mexico and Colorado uh, for the Southwest Shootout Regional Poetry Slam. And inevitably, whenever something like that happens here, two or three poets stay. Like they literally move here. Ah, I promise you in a year, two of the poets that came to the thing will be like, yeah, I just decided I'd go to Albuquerque. I don't know. Pick up and move. So that wonderful. Yeah. That's a great. That's such a great answer. As a matter of fact, this whole conversation has been just full of wonderful, wonderful things. Thank you so much. You. Um, you have brought a special treat for us. Oh, yes. Um, I sure did. Could you tell us about this young writer and... And then we get the joy of listening to this magnificent reader read the work of someone else, his student. And I think that's just a, just a great joy. Uh, so if you'd tell us a little bit about uh, the poet. Yes, we're, we're honored. We're honored with, this, with the sharing of Tessa Shell, who's been a participant in Volsis in the past. And this year, she's actually on board as kind of a, a mentor, student oh, mentor oh, with us this year. So she's like in that nether region between uh, like being beyond and past the Volsis because now she's a college student, but also uh, waiting for, you know, me, Carlos and Dials to get old and die off and get out of the way. And so it's going to be her program. In the future. Uh, she's a fantastic writer. She's a fantastic performer. She has a really uh, genuine spirit about her that she's just real easy with the students. The students are real easy with her. And, and that's what we look for. There's lots of artists that can art. There's lots of artists that are really good at arting, but everybody who's an expert at what they do can't teach it necessarily. And that teaching is a very special art of its own. And so she has that. She has that kind of rapport with the students. She's very approachable, but which is hard for artists to do sometimes because She'll get on stage and do this thing that's fierce and intimidating. And then they're all like, I can't do that. Whatever. I give up. You know, but then she's able to, like, talk to them on the level and be a peer to them. And that's really what we try to do. We try to make ourselves human to them. Because when they see us at a show, we're in robot performer mode. And, you know, it's beautiful. We've been given a gift. And we, we work hard to kind of fine tune that gift. Yeah. But then we get off stage and we're regular people. And so how do we let them know that you can do that? You don't have yeah. to, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Tesha. And uh, this one's called New. And uh, I believe she calls it that because it's new. It's nice to meet you. I'm a... Mm, I'm plain. Milk plain. The older I get, the more colorful I wish I was. I'm hitting street lights, wondering where my life is going. I'm not the writer I used to be. I'm not the dancer I used to step. I am something, surely. Sometimes I feel like I need a helmet and knee pads to kick my own ass. I'm so hard on me. Sometimes I hurt myself to see if I can be something purple and healing like the sunrise. I miss my abusers. I have less to write about. I want hieroglyphics beaten into my chest again as bruises from my bookshelf or his handprints or as my fists and I grow into a warrior. Maybe one day I'll become a good prayer. But today, I think I'd like to be a collector, gathering bits of broken glass and moments shared between good friends, late at night, between a family and a table, between food and fiesta, hurt feelings and held hands, between kindness and a deep, vast expanse of nothing we are floating in. I'm plain, because I got lots of space to color. I am new. Today is the oldest I've ever been. I'm constantly learning. I've recycled the past to feed my present. I'm finding sometimes strength is silent, slow. It takes me months to let go, like a grandmother has to let go. But it's over and over again. I'm reincarnating and it burns. It burns in a way that I'm going to be a new person tomorrow. Start all over. I am Tesha Shell. I am always new. It's nice to meet you. Oh my God! Wonderful! Oh, yeah. beautiful! 
Yeah, oh. I'm like tearing up. I think no, it's like no, sunblock in my too. eye, but I, I'm no, just gonna, no, no, I'm just gonna call it. I think God. it's the sunblock in my eye. <laughs> so. yeah, we were gonna have her here, but the studio's too small. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't do it. Oh, it's just, that's just so powerful, so beautiful. And thank you for the marvelous, magical reading, my God. What a wonderful afternoon we've had with you. I, I'm so grateful. I hope we get to do this again. Let's do it. And um, <laughs> we just, there's so much to talk about in this. I want to ask you one one last question, if I might. What what role do you see poetry playing, if I can use those awful words, in the development, the ongoing development of a more humane culture mm. in the United States? Man, that's I think that's the trick. I think that's the secret. You know, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about putting people, and we were specifically talking about underrepresented and marginalized populations, but in a very simple level, putting people back at the center of the story. And I think that that's, that's what makes it more humane. I think it's hard to go to a poetry event, especially like the format of the slam, because in, in, you know, the slam, for better or for worse, has its, its flaws and its, and its things that it does really well. But um, it, that whole idea of a democratic space where anyone can read, um, and it's not just, you know, oh, the poet laureate's coming, and he's an expert, and you sit and listen to him for... 40 minutes and if you're lucky he'll let you buy his book and he might sign it for you and then you go home like that's not a dialogue right you know and and, uh and and though i really enjoy those readings if you're looking to book me i do do, i do those um but uh but i think that what's really rich is that when you go to like a a round robin reading like they have those all the time like uh, we just lost a fabulous reading um started by lisa gill uh, east of Edith, and that allowed people in a non-slam format to kind of come and share with an open mic, and then they'd have a feature, um, or the slams themselves, you know, where it's just so democratic, where at any given night, if you stay for the whole thing, you're going to hear 15 or maybe 20 different people tell you a story, right? Um, first of all, as adults, we've gotten out of practice. We don't do bedtime stories anymore, so we always need to hear more stories, yes, yes. you know, so it's a good it's a good place to get caught up with that. But after you've listened to 15 different people with different beliefs, with different values, with different politics, um, from different backgrounds and different experiences, it's hard to it's hard to make that person your enemy. Yes. I'm not going to say it's hard to not like because we have family members that we don't like. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, you might yeah, not yeah. like where someone's coming from. Yeah. And uh, and I stand by this notion that everybody that reads a poem is not a good person, just like everybody who writes a song right. or, 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 or makes a film or becomes president is not a good person. Right. You know. But uh, but you, but you don't. That person's not your enemy because you've had a chance to hear them out. You had a chance to share. You've had a chance to see where they're coming from. And even if you don't like it, you, there's a certain kind of respect that you have when you have to spend time with people and share stories with people. You know, and I think that that's where poetry helps because it brings us back to the campfire where people have to talk oh, again. They have gosh. to talk to each other. Um, and it's interesting because I've had workshops with students and I've asked them, like, is poetry dead? You know, what do you guys think? You're teenagers. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Have at it, you know. And overwhelmingly, they're like, no, we need it. And even in this age of having interactions via social media, there is no replacement for that. There's no replacement for that one-on-one or that one-on-ten or that one-on-a-hundred that actually happens. It's, it's a different energy when it's in the room. Uh, and I think that that's poetry continues to fight for that space and to keep to keep that space open and i think that's the job of, of not just the poets but the people who come and say on a friday night i'm gonna go away from the tv and go watch that like i'm gonna take time and go do that like they're they're creating it and participating in the ceremony as well so what a magnificent description uh, it's just wonderful wonderful this has been such a joy for me i just my mind is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger thank you thanks to you and i just feel so good this has been um, a joy, and let's do do it again. Yes, and um, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, BB. I'd love to come back. It's an honor. There's a legacy of, again, like I said earlier, without belaboring it, that uh, many people like yourself have started here, and I get to do what I do because of that. So I thank, oh, you. thank you. I thank Benito behind the camera, making us look good, <laughs> letting us wear Bermuda shorts. Not, 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 really. not really. We have. Grown-up pants on. <laughs> <laughs> He's making me look good. Right. It's a hard job. It's a hard job. All right. All right. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.